name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My adorable Jesus, may our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts beat in unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our lips pray together to gain mercy from the Eternal Father. Amen. Yeah. Do you love Jesus? I tell you, life is so beautiful when you love God. Amen? Amen. Would you raise both your hands if, if you love God? And say, God, I love you. God. Reveal yourself to me. In joyful and wondrous ways. Save my children. Save my family. You are most beautiful. I want to live with you forever. And your beautiful mother. Amen. Isn't it great to be Catholic? Beloved, I, I really feel this way that as Jesus said in the Holy Gospel, he said that we must find the pearl of great price. And I believe the Catholic faith is the pearl of great price. Amen. It's the greatest thing since sliced bread, isn't it? Well, brothers and sisters, we have some beautiful things to talk about and, and to discover and to do today. Um, God, beloved, is a God of miracles. He's a God of miracles. And I began to see that as a child, and I've seen it all through my life and my priesthood. Here's one funny one, that when I was a teenager, I talked to my dad. My daddy was a big fellow. My dad was a judge. And he'd been a Navy officer. And he actually had been a Golden Gloves boxer in the Navy. He's a pretty tough guy. When I was a teenager, I wanted to get my own job, you know. I did, I mowed yards as a kid, but I wanted like a regular job. And so I needed a car to get to work, to earn some money. And so I came to my daddy and I said, Dad, Dad, I need a car so I can get a job. And my dad said, well, Jim, that's fine, uh, but you, you need to earn the money to buy your own car. We were raised that way, you know what I mean? You always, you earn what you got. So I said to my dad, well, Daddy, how can I earn the money to buy a car to get to work if I don't have a car to get to work to get the money? And my dad said, well, that's a good question. He says, but Jim, I don't have any money right now to buy you a car. I was going to pay him back, of course. And at that point, because we, we, I was one of eight children, there wasn't always a whole lot of money to go around. So I said, okay, Dad, I backed off uh, because I really, really wanted a job. But I, I, I backed off because I didn't want to be fresh to my father. I was a hot-headed teenager, if you know what I mean. And sometimes you don't get what you want, you start like, like talking a little bit fresh to your dad or mom, and that's never good. The Bible says, the fourth commandment, what's the fourth commandment? And notice it never said this, honor your father and your mother only when you like them. It doesn't say that, does it? Or honor your father and mother only on those days in which they glow with divine perfection. No, honor them no matter what. And so I, I sort of cut my big mouth and went into my room because I, I was kind of a, someone who would argue and I didn't want to argue. And I went into my bedroom and I knelt down and I made the most famous prayer of all teenagers in the world. I knelt down, I looked up to heaven and I said, God, my father doesn't understand me. It's the most famous teenage prayer in the universe. Amen? So I said, God, my father, he doesn't understand me. I need a car to get to work. Could you get me a car? In the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I finished my prayer. The next day, true story, five people called my dad 
out of the blue, five different families to offer me a car. Mama Mia. I'm not kidding you, five different people called my parents. I don't know how they knew, because I didn't say anything to anybody, to offer me a car. Three were free. And two were like, you know, junkers, maybe for $300. God the Father heard my prayer as a teenager. And he will hear the prayers of every child and teenager here. So look out, Dad and Mom, your child might pray for a Mercedes Benz tonight. He's so good, our Father. He wants to be your friend. And he wants you to be familiar with him. There's a beautiful saying, a title for Jesus, that I read once many years ago. It said, who is Jesus? He is the distant God brought close. A definition of Jesus. He's the distant God brought close. And so, beloved, in your relationship with our beautiful triune God, always be on the alert when it feels like he's a million miles away. Because that's not true, you see? It's, it's a lie. And if you feel like you're lonely and he's a million miles away, you know what I would do if I were you? I would jump on my knees, and the first thing I would say is, Satan, leave in the name of Jesus. That's a demon of deception. God is always with you and I. Amen? He is a God, beloved, of beautiful, beautiful love. And he says, let me squander my love on you. He respects our freedom. He's like a gentleman. But if I were you, I would open my heart to God wide this Christmas season and say, Lord, I want miracles. Work in my life and do wondrous things. Amen? And so, beloved, I want to tell you what happened to me when I was a college student. And I was going through a rough time in college. University of Florida in Gainesville. It was like party town, USA, where I went to school. And I was raised in a different kind of environment. So I wasn't used to having people growing and smoking marijuana in the rooms next to me. Growing marijuana right there in the dorm rooms, growing it in the windowsills. And getting drunk on a regular basis. And doing other horrible things we won't talk about. And I was not used to that. I was more sheltered. And it really bothered me. It got to the bottom of my soul. And because I didn't know that people lived that way. Like I heard about it, like maybe on a television show or in a book. I didn't know people actually lived in darkness. And it, it broke me inside to be around, let's say, in my own dorm, my own hallway where I was. Maybe there's 25 of us young guys and like 23 out of the 25 are living in mortal sin. I'd never seen that before. I was confused. And I actually called home to my dad and mom and I started, I was surprised, I cried on the phone. And I was a big boy, I was a strong boy. I had a Navy scholarship, I was an athlete. I started to weep on the phone. I, was, I shocked myself. I said, Dad and Mom, and I was weeping. I had never seen anything like it. The sin and this darkness and the filthy language too. And I remember that I broke my mother and father's heart. I didn't mean to. And they said, Jimmy, we'll come up and get you right now. And that's when I realized what was happening. I was weeping. I was breaking their heart. And I said, no, Dad and Mom, don't come and get me right now. Thank you. I guess I just had to get it out. And I started going to the Catholic Student Center a lot, every day there, to try to rebuild my peace. I did not know that people lived in mortal sin. And so I had to rebuild my faith, so to speak. It makes you like even doubt God when you're a teenager. What? How could this be? They don't even go to church. They don't pray. It was horrible, to be honest with you. Even though I loved the school, it was a very good school. I was like an honor student and I loved to study, but that was awful. 
It shattered me. I had to rebuild my faith. I made a retreat during this time at the Catholic Student Center. We went out to a retreat center and I made it with a bunch of other kids from the Catholic Student Center. And it was a beautiful, beautiful retreat. Beautiful retreat for young people. We were all like 19, 20, 21. And at the end of the retreat on Sunday night, they had um, a confessions and then a beautiful celebration. And it wasn't getting through to me though, the retreat. Everyone else was being touched by the retreat. It wasn't touching my heart. As I watched and I heard what they said and the, these beautiful little practices with the young people like blindfolding the teenagers and having them walk or fall in someone's arms and things like that to teach you how to trust. It didn't move my spirit for some reason. I was always a thinker, so I thought it through before they did it. So it was no, it no longer a surprise for me. It didn't work for me. I thought it was too like too much of a trick they were trying to do. So for me, the other kids were crying with joy, every one of them, boys and girls both. And I was crying for sadness. Because I wanted God so hungry, so hungry for God. And I wasn't reaching him. They were overwhelmed with joy and I was miserable. And I finally, I couldn't bear it. Everyone was rejoicing. And they were hugging me like, because I had tears just like they did. They thought I was happy like they were. I was miserable. I had to leave. I couldn't bear it. And I went back to the barracks where the boys were sleeping. I thought, good, I just get all by myself and just sleep and go to bed early. I went back to the barracks and lo and behold, two of the guys were already in bed. I thought I'd be all by myself so I could cry and pout to myself. There were two men there, two young guys, and they said, hey, Jim, what are you doing here? And I looked at them, I was so um, upset. I wanted to be all by myself. And I said to them, oh guys, I can't stand it. I said this to them, all of you have been touched by the Holy Spirit and you're filled with joy. I'm called to be a priest, I told them. I knew that. I'm called to be a priest and I don't even know God as well as you do. And I ran out of that room. I was so upset. I'm supposed to be a priest. I don't even feel what you feel. And I ran out straight into the woods at a Catholic camp, you see. Out of the woods, I was weeping. I felt so miserable. And I ran through the woods all by myself because all I wanted was God. And I couldn't feel him at all. And they had him, but I didn't. And it didn't seem right to me. And I said, God, what's wrong? I love you. I'm not smoking the marijuana. I'm not cursing. I'm not sleeping with the girls. I'm a faithful Catholic and I can't feel you. How come they all can feel you and I can't? And I felt this amazing, horrible loneliness for the first time. And it rose up. I stopped. I stopped running in a little clearing in the middle of the woods, in the middle of the night, like 11 o'clock at night. They were still having their party, their Christian party. Two of my friends were sleeping in the bunk. I was all by myself in the woods. And I stopped at this clearing. I was drenched with tears. And I was like dying. And I said, God, why can't I feel you? Why don't you love me too? And as I said that, I felt this horrible, like a loneliness, all the pain of my entire life. It's hard to describe. It felt like a poison in my feet, a poison from all the rejection and loneliness of my life. And maybe like trying to prove myself to God too, you see? And it came moving up my legs, this horrible poison feeling all the loneliness and the rejection and the hatred I had gone through in my life. And it went up into my chest. I could feel it. When it got up to my neck, I felt in the middle of the forest in the dark, I felt a hand touch my chin. I was weeping and the poison came up to my throat, this feeling. 
of all the loneliness and rejection of my life. And this hand touched my chin and I groaned, I mean I groaned from my belly and I said, why, why is everyone happy and I feel suicidal, why? And this hand, as I said that, lifted my chin up into the air, a hand. And I opened my eyes. I didn't know who was touching me. There was nobody there. I looked up. At that moment, I opened my eyes. At that precise moment, a star, a shooting star, flashed across the sky. Magnificent! At the very moment, the invisible hand moved my chin and I opened my eyes. This star at that precise second flashed across the universe. And it cut me like a knife through my stomach. <sighs> I was startled to put it mildly and I fell to my knees on the ground in the woods outside at midnight. And I began to shake. And I thought, oh no, he's real, he's real, it's all real, he heard me, he felt me, he loved me, he responded to me, and he moved a star, which is probably bigger than a billion tons of fire across the sky to tell one teenager that he loved him. Amen? Amen. And so, the next week I was back in classes and I told my favorite professor what happened. He was a wonderful fellow. He was my philosophy professor. And I said, doctor, after my class, we were outside, I think it was, like, I think it was Tuesday night after my philosophy class. He was a wonderful professor. Wonderful, like Socrates, with a big white hair and a big white beard. He taught us philosophy. He was a wonderful man. And I said, Doctor, I need to tell you what happened. He was one of the most wonderful uh, professors, teachers I've ever had in my life. And he was not Catholic. He was not even a believer. He was an atheist. But he was, he was filled with love. I loved him like a father. My dad tended to be like too strong. He was a judge and a lawyer, too strong on us. Dr. Grafie was, was more like Santa Claus. And I said, Doctor, I need to tell you what happened because I loved him and trusted him. He would bring us all to his home for class. We would have wine and cheese while he taught us philosophy. The best class I ever had. His wife was just as beautiful as he was. So I told him what happened, doctor, I was dying and I felt so lonely and, and I, I wanted to know why God didn't touch me. And I know he didn't believe in God, but I still loved him. And I told him all that happened because he was like a father to me. And I said, doctor, at the precise moment I felt this hand lift my chin and, and I, it pulled me up and I opened my eyes. And right when I got ready to tell Dr. Grafie what happened, right then at that moment, another star flashed over the sky, over his head, as I described to him what happened. I kid you not. As I went to tell him, Dr. A, a star, I couldn't say the word star, another shooting star, this is several nights later, flashes over the campus of the University of Florida in Gainesville, a gigantic star flashed over his head and he saw it. And he said to me, well, Jim, maybe there's something to all of this after all. I think he started to become a believer that night. Amen? Isn't God beautiful? Well, fast forward quite a few years, 
And I shared this story that I'm sharing with you in Philadelphia a couple of years ago. And there was in the congregation a young man with his family. When I went up the aisle, I saw him. And I turned to him and said, you're going to be a priest one day and a missionary in a foreign country. And I went up. Well, he was accepted to become a seminarian in my community. He's studying right now. His name is Noah. He's a holy young man. And Noah was in training and he was having a bad week earlier this year. To study to be a priest can be difficult sometimes. We have sometimes some rough days and rough weeks. You know, you don't have a wife and children. They'd be disciplined. And Noah was having a rough week. And he remembered me, I'm like his spiritual father. And he said to God earlier this year, he said, God, you gave my father, Father Jim, a shooting star when he was dying. Father God, I'm dying. Could you send me a shooting star? And right then, a star flashed over the sky, over his head, this year, right at that very moment in Texas. Amen. Right then, it flashed. And Noah and his mother and father wrote to me, is God good or is God good? Now, I was sharing this story about my experience at the University of Florida in Gainesville and then how Noah, my son, my spiritual son, is now a seminarian, how he asked for a star and God sent him right then and there. I was sharing this about two months ago in New York at the shrine of the Mystical Rose, Our Lady Mystical Rose in New York. As I share this double story, there was another teenage boy sitting in the back with his parents. And after the talk, he heard what I just shared with you about myself and about Noah. About two months ago in New York, Mark said to me later the next day, Father, I couldn't sleep that night. I couldn't sleep. So I got up around 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, and about midnight he took a walk. It's, it's a really safe place, a beautiful shrine out in the mountains. He took a walk among the shrine, and he went to the statue of Our Lady. He was a very good young man, a teenager. And he said to God, God, you gave Noah a shooting star. Could you give me one too? You gave Noah one, Father Jim's son. Can't you give me one too? Or do I count as nothing? Can you give me one? Right then, a star flashed across the sky over his head in New York two months ago. True story. And Mark is precocious. You know what he said? This is kind of funny. Mark actually said to God, oh, Thank you, God. But, but, is that my one and only miracle for my whole life? Is that it? Is that the only one I get for the rest of my life? Is that it, Lord? Are there any others waiting for me? And right then, a second star flashed over the sky, over his head. Mamma mia. I had him share that the next day to the whole group. They stood up and applauded him, you know. I think he's on his way to the seminary, by the way. Amen? Now, isn't that amazing? So it happened to me, and then my, my son Noah, so Mark must be my grandson. Right? He learned it from Noah, he's my spiritual grandson. Amen? I've got white hair, I need a few grandchildren, right? Now, beloved, do you see how good God is? Now, it wasn't just me, it was Noah and Mark. God loves every teenager. Amen? He loves all young people over in Italy. The Holy Father approved the beatification of a teenage boy in Italy. His name is Carlo Acutis. 
15 years of age. His body is actually partially incorrupt. He's now in a CC, his body. He's the first saint in the history of the church who's dressed in blue jeans. He's in blue jeans. Amen? He only passed away in 2006. He was 15 years old, and Carlo was an amazing, actually he was a computer expert. He was a genius on the computer. And he never used a computer for inappropriate things. He actually, he put together a display. He was trying to think as a 14 and 15 year old boy, how do I get my other teenage friends to come to mass? When he was a little boy, he converted his mother and father. They didn't go to mass. He dragged them to church with him as a boy. His parents were converted through him and then the whole family, aunts and uncles and cousins. He loved the Lord, especially in the Eucharist. He said, how can I get my friends to be converted? And so what Carlo did, finally he prayed and prayed and prayed. He got the idea, Eucharistic miracles, which are all over the world. And I shouldn't say too much about this, but I've had two in my own masses. Twice in my life, I have, I've had hosts bleed, blood come on them. Nothing to do with me. It's because of God. Amen? I've seen the ones that I've seen in my own masses. They're happening all over the world. Amen? Amen. For the Lord to prove to his Catholic people, and maybe to the Protestants too, that he's truly present in the Eucharist. Amen? Amen? Carlo knew that. He made a display through his computer of every Eucharistic miracle that's ever happened with photographs and descriptions. It was so precise and so beautiful the Vatican printed it up in a book, the Vatican. He was called home unexpectedly. He was having headaches one day, a perfectly healthy boy, a soccer player, and like a normal kid. He's a good looking kid, normal, polite, good. He loved God. Everyone was touched by his spirit. He was humble, but fervent. He had headaches one day, he was feeling really sick. Mama said, we better bring you to the hospital just to check it out. So he said, yes, Mama, they went to the hospital back in 2006. The doctor finally came out after some tests and said, well, I have bad news for you. Your son has leukemia. He doesn't have very long to live at all. Almost full-blown leukemia overnight. His mom, of course, his parents were upset. But Carlo looked at his mom and he said, Mama, don't cry. God's given me a free ticket to heaven. God has given me a ticket to heaven. Three days later, he died. His body is almost completely incorrupt. He's now blessed Carlo Agutis. And I feel his presence right now in the church. I feel his presence right now. And teach your beautiful young people to pray to Carlo Acutis, and maybe you pray to him for your young people. Amen? Well, his mother, Mrs. Acutis, is still alive. A friend of mine just spoke to her a few weeks ago. I have friends in Italy. And she has been receiving supernatural dreams. That frequently happens with saints. The other family members get blessed too, you see. She's been having supernatural dreams. Saint Francis of Assisi has been appearing to Mrs. Acutis. In fact, his holy body, little Carlo, is there in Assisi, where Francis goes his favorite saint. And more people are visiting Carlo than Saint Francis. Do you think Francis is getting jealous? I don't think so. The saints are very humble. Amen? He's probably relieved. He's probably tired of all the visitors, St. Francis. He's been appearing, St. Francis, to Mrs. Acutis just recently and for years now. And he appeared to Mama Acutis 
maybe a year ago, and said to Mrs. Akuta, it's a true story, you can actually find this on the internet. In fact, you can find Mrs. Akutis on YouTube. It's, it's good to hear her testimony. This beautiful mother whose son converted her to the faith. Amen? It's an amazing testimony. But now Francis of Assisi, considered the greatest saint of all time, next to Mary and Joseph, has been appearing. And he told Mrs. Akutis this last year. Your son, Carlo, occupies a very high place in heaven. Mamma mia, a teenager. He occupies a very high place in heaven. And then, St. Francis said to Mrs. Acutis, when your son is canonized, not if, when. When your son is canonized, God will send forth the Holy Spirit over the earth. And he will raise up from among the young, the teenagers, a veritable army of saints all over the world, beginning the day Carlo is canonized. Amen. Are you getting the Holy Spirit goosebumps? Because I'm getting them right now. Beloved, St. Louis prophesied that hundreds of years ago. That in these final days, God would raise up from among the young, among the kids and the teenagers, an army of saints who would be holier than all the other great saints put together. St. Louis de Montfort said that. So did St. Therese. Beloved, it's about to happen. Amen. Can we give God some glory? Would you raise your hands to God? Would you give him, just give him a round of applause to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? <laughs>